Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March 2022 version of our Q&As. And um, it falls on a very auspicious date for us. Um, it falls on St. Patrick's Day, which is a cool date for K&K &K because it was the first time that we met and decided to form a, com a company was actually as we were having drinks uh, in Nashville with our respective spouses um, discussing the business that we could create. So our actual official anniversary is June 1st, but this is the day that we all decided. Um, so, so it's a very meaningful day for us. I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. And those of you that submitted questions ahead of time, wow, good stuff, good stuff. Okay, so let's jump right in. Cindy, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, question number one. If nursing, PT, and OT are ordered at start of care and nurse is admitting, do the PT and OT also have to do their initial evaluations within 48 hours of the referral discharge from the facility, or does this apply only to the admission start of care visit by the RN? Well, let's peel that onion two layers. The first layer is, is it required by CMS that the other disciplines are in within 48 hours of the admission visit? That answer is no. The 48 hours from receipt of referral is the standard for getting the patient admitted to the home health agency. That's why we have that question on OASIS about did you have a physician ordered start of care date? Because obviously then they expect the start of care date to match. If you had a date of referral, they're looking for what was the time gap between the date of referral and the start of care date to see how often we are in that compliant 48 hour window. Now, when you ask, is it required? It could be required if agency policy says that. And sometimes agency policy takes that 48 hour and expands it to say any other order discipline has to be in the home within 48 hours of the start of care. If the agency policy states that, you will be surveyed against it. And the, trust me, Sherry, this is the voice of experience. Um, my early home care career, that was a policy. And we ran into significant issues with patients that, you know, didn't want to be seen then. What did that even mean for, you know, patients that were admitted on Friday? And yes, it was back in the old dark ages where no therapy was on the weekends. That wasn't our choice. They just didn't do it. Um, and so it was like, well, every time somebody got admitted on Friday, aren't we out of compliance on Monday? And the surveyor would come and get us. And we'd have to write all these extra documents and everything else. And it turned out, it was about an agency policy and the agency policy didn't have to say 48 hours. So if your agency policy says that you want to check it and then have a discussion about what makes the most sense to have in a policy. Now, push back to that, Sherry, third layer of the onion is, well, that I'm going to put down like nothing or why don't I just put two weeks? All right. If you get too loosey goosey with that. The question becomes, are these important relevant services to this patient or not? If evaluations are not happening for five days, 10 days, okay, that raises question about, was this really a need of the patient? And if it was really a need and it's taking this long, is this a staffing issue, which is very real at this current point in time? If that is, I need to be clear in my documentation that I informed the patient and their family of that kind of delay so that they have the option if they want to go to a different provider to get it sooner, they can. If they elect to stay, we're very clear that we have told them that. Um, but to write a policy that is either so open ended or so wide could raise some question about the need for those services. So, yeah, from a, I, I could have just said the rules say no, Sherry, but those other things can come into play that I've seen therapists in particular say, well, she said it's not a rule, it's not a rule, I don't have to do it. If it's in your agency policy, you could still get into trouble on survey. That's an excellent clarification. It's basically you're held to whichever's the toughest, your your policies, mm -hmm. the state's policies, or the or the federal policies. Um, and, and that's oftentimes not mentioned enough. Um, right. So this next one's interesting. I'm gonna combine it with another question that we received is, is someone wrote that they're hearing about denials related to a therapy assessment. Before we go into that, the th therapy reassessment, creating the denials, um, I wanted to ask the specific question and then we can maybe lead into what we're seeing in some of the auditing that's going on. 
Okay, does an OASIS assessment qualify or count as a therapy reassessment when it meets the criteria of timing every 30 days and has comment to support that, that event goals are updated, retesting of standardized tests and or a narrative of a therapy reassessment in a summary statement? Again, as written, the short answer would be yes, but it only counts because of the description that follows. To say that an OASIS, completed OASIS would be a therapy reassessment in and of itself would never work because OASIS is discipline neutral data collection. The clarifiers in the question of I met the timing requirement and I met the content exp expectations, all of that together is a resounding yes, that would count. We have to remind ourselves that the regulation around the minimally every 30 day therapy reassessment has never required a particular form. We don't have to title it something. So if I'm there at the home to do an OASIS assessment and it happens to fall in the 30 days and I do everything else I need to do, I can make this a multitasker visit. I took care of all that in one shot. Um, and we highly encourage that because if I'm there already and can do these things, also it's minimally every 30 days. If there's been a change in the patient and I'm there and I to supervise the assistant and I meet the criteria of a therapy reassessment, that can count as well. But I think the key element of that question is the rest of it. We have to meet all the rest of that to say that it meets the intent. The one catch, Sherry, is it may cause an issue in terms of tracking that the agency might be a little uncomfortable with to say, well, you did it during an OASIS visit. It isn't what we assign in our EMR as a therapy reassessment, so we may lose count. We just have to make sure we keep the count. That doesn't mean I can't do that from a practical or regulatory standpoint, but it may throw off the tracking a little bit and you wanna make sure that that visit would somehow be tagged in a way that it was a therapy reassessment so we know what the next 30 day window is. And I want to just throw a caveat in there too, Cindy, um, that it is minimally every 30 days. So, yep. so if you if you do the reassessment at day 25, you've then restarted the 30 day clock. Um, and a lot of people don't understand that. They have a therapist go out because an, an issue is identified or a change in status is identified and they miss the opportunity to take care of the reassessment visit when they're close to that 30 days. Again, it has to be done at least every 30 days, um, at the minimal every 30 days. So, so if you do that early, just remember that you can start your 30 day clock again. Um, and, and that's just one of those semantics things that gets forgotten sometimes. And I will answer the second part of this question. Yes, uh, the, third, the therapy reassessment is under the microscope with the auditors currently. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, trending and tracking towards what is in those therapy reassessments. Cindy, do you want to talk about that briefly, what they're looking for? Well, I think this, the scary thing is that it appears to be an extension of the thought process behind therapy denials in the PPS system, the previous payment methodology, where therapy visits often found themselves in the hot seat because of the relationship between therapy visits and reimbursement, that even a partial denial could result in a repayment back to CMS because it puts you in a different visit grouping. Now that that no longer exists, you kind of go, well, maybe therapy is not necessarily going to be a target area because it doesn't matter if you chop a few visits off. I mean, you'd have to really get rid of a bunch of therapy visits and create a lupa of sorts um, to make it financially a payback. Well, be careful what the thought process is because that appears to be what's happening here. What we're seeing is increased interest in the therapy reassessment. Interestingly enough, minimally every 30 days puts it very close, more often than not, in proximity to the end of a 30 day payment period. So if this therapy reassessment is deemed to not meet the expectations, not just timing, but also content, then the visits that go into the next 30 day payment period are being denied. So 
it is a significant hit now within a two payment periods within a 60 day episode. If they're able to determine that you didn't justify the need to continue. And so all those visits that went into the next payment period are all just disallowed. And that could very easily render it. Nothing was in the 30 day. Give us all that 30 day back um, enough of it got knocked out that it's now a lupa. Give us the money back. You can see where there is a financial element to that. But if I can elaborate a little bit more, Sherry, we have been arguing and advocating about the content. From day 1, I mean, I've been on standing there on the podium waving, waving my fist since it was the, you know, 13 all the combination and then if somebody dropped out and we had the 13 7 whatever those numbers were i'm having a blackout at the moment but when it was all about visit numbers and finally we went to the minimum every 30 day the timing was not enough and the reasons we're seeing specified for denial is that there is a lack of subsequent objective measure so they're not saying there was no test with a name they're saying that there is limited objective measure on the initial eval, a reassessment comes, there isn't clear evidence of many of these measures being redone, which the regulation has said they expect to see objective reasoning why you're gonna continue or discontinue therapy. If they're present, they're not being analyzed. So the clinician is not saying the score was this or the measure was this, the measure is now that, this is what it means. So. Just because a measure is better than the previous, okay, they're better than they were. What does that mean? Is there potential for continued improvement? Do we now need to pivot this to maintenance because we got the gain, but I'm concerned they won't stay here unless we continue? Was there potentially they're the same and we had a, you know, some issues that impeded the plan. I still expect improvement down the road. This is why we're going to continue. The regulation very early on was clear about sequential objective measurement and interpretation to justify the decision to continue or discontinue care. And Sherry, you, you heard my rant. How many times have we looked at a reassessment and their timing is right, but it basically says continue per POC, continue mm -hmm. per physician order. And we've said, this is not going to work. This, this is not a clinical judgment. It does not carry the weight of, in my professional opinion, this is why I'm going to continue therapy. And I would argue, and like your thoughts on this, Sherry, I think it's just another manifestation of the problem we've had with recertification, where the patient has had 60 days worth of care. Here's a research. Yep, it's all done in the five day window. Everything's great. But the plan of care, other than the cert dates, looks exactly the same. And it's like, so you did all this for 60 days. Apparently it didn't work. So you're just going to do it for 60 more days. I mean, wh what's your reasoning behind that? Wh why are you thinking that's a good plan? I, I don't think it's an unreasonable question for a payer source to say, why do you plan to continue? Well, and, and I think that people need to remember that everything that's related to this kind of question needs to go back to the F word, not Frank, not freak, and not the bad word, but function. So what does these, what do these um, new uh, scores mean in terms of that person's function? In terms of those items on the OASIS, like we talk about care planning with the OASIS all the time, Cindy, how does this relate to their ambulation score, their bathing score, those kinds of things? As we move into value-based purchasing, it's really important that we suss that out in our documentation. And there, that's what that's what CMS is preparing for. That's what the auditors are preparing for, and that's what we need to provide as providers. Um, but, but second, Sherry, okay. no, no, I'm just going to say I want to just clarify. This is Cornetti and Craft has never been about um, fear mongering, but this is honestly saying from reliable individuals, the number of denials is continuing to increase specifically around that issue. So taking a look at it, getting an audit, getting it checked. If they haven't come to you, be grateful. But it doesn't appear that this is, is abating because sure, they're making money. I mean, they're getting money back to the Medicare program. And anytime they're successful at that, they keep going. 
Exactly. Exactly. Anytime they can recoup that and cause it a call it a cert area or something along those lines, they're going to do that in order to keep the benefit. Um, say that they're policing the benefit, if you will. Okay, I'm going to change gears a bit and ask about lupus. The question that we had um, sent to us is, does a resumption of care start the visit count over for a lupa? It does not. Um, that we have to look at now again, we're talking about the timing issue because we have to deal with we have a 60 day episode of care. So we have a start of care. We're either going to discharge them or recertify them and a resumption is an intervening event. We do have to look at where they land in the 30 day payment periods because that could affect how many visits are in each of the 30 day payment period. So it could be that we had somebody and they went into the hospital day 28, the first period. So all the visits that were in there are all the visits that were done. The patient is in the hospital for like two weeks and comes back near the end of the next 30 day payment period. The number of visits between there and the end could be a lupa, but it's not a direct result of saying it's because a resumption makes lupus. So it depends where it lands within those 30 day payment periods. So if it came within the same one, so we admitted somebody a week later, they went in the hospital a week after that, they came back we're within the same 30 day. The visit count would pick right back up because we're within that parameter of the 30 day. But if it ventured over into another one, then we could potentially see it's not a recount, but it's where it lands within 30 day payment periods. I want to remind everyone that if you have any questions that come up while we're while we're answering the questions that were submitted, please put them into the Q and A so that we can answer them. And um, thank you for that. And um, next question, another hot another hot button issue: If all homebound requirements criteria are checked on the Plan of Care 485, however, no specifics are documented, is this considered to be a deficiency? Sherry, I am turning that one back to you as the one who recently uh, blasted about a very similar issue um, and your thoughts about the checkboxing of homebound status. Yeah, a click box, a, a clicked box that says taxing effort, um, uh, can leave home for uh, short periods of time, uh, requires the assistance of another. I think I've, I've probably covered most of the ones that are on most of the EMRs. That is not sufficient. Uh, it needs to be very specific to the client or the patient that you're treating why they cannot leave the home. Because there are patients that none of those criteria that are on most of the EMRs uh, apply to them. There are patients that simply cannot leave the home because the physician said it was a risk. And during COVID, we saw that a lot because of the risk of COVID and the risk of infection in our very, um, in our morbidly obese or diabetic or elderly folks, you know, super old, if you will, they, they were told not to leave the home because it was a risk to them, to their health and to their recuperation. So, so during that time, you had to document things other than those generic click boxes. So yeah, you're at, you're at a deficiency if you're not making it clear why that patient is appropriately treated in the home. Is that what you were looking I for? Would also, yeah, well, no, <laughs> that, I mean, that's exactly what you hit. And I think the other thing is, the, the boxes, I don't say the boxes in and of itself are the problem, but the boxes either regurgitate back the language of homeboundedness, but don't really say how it's patient specific, or they create made up things. Uh, you know, my favorite, Sherry, you know, the patient cannot ambulate more than 10 feet and it's check marked. And then the therapist is there and walks them 50 feet. Or yeah. you go back to the Oasis and it says they did 50 feet in two turns with supervision. Okay, wait a minute. You put down that they're homebound because they couldn't walk more than 10 feet. And distance is nowhere to be found in the regulations around homebound status. There's no magical number that makes you homebound and no magical number that in and of itself suddenly renders you not. But those kinds of arbitrary ones are also problematic because they tend to then be contradicted very often within the same note, which makes the risk even more. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the, there came some guidance or some um, rumors around that, that it had to be indicated on every single note of homebound status. And so the EMR companies responded by putting a checkbox on each of the visit notes that said patient is homebound due to the, it reads almost exactly verbatim out of the manual. Well, that just doesn't work. There needs to be some dialogue in the notes of each of the clinicians 
that indicates why they're still receiving this um, care at home, why it is appropriate for them to receive that care at home. Be it an infected wound, be it the, the shortness of breath after certain amounts of activity, be it you know how they responded to a trip out to lunch with their with their caregiver on, on the way to and from a um, a doctor's appointment. Those kinds of things need to be need to be um, very clear in each of the notes. That doesn't mean to write more. It means that you have to write appropriately and write very succinctly why that person is receiving that care in the home. Um, well, Sherry, so Sherry, you well, you delivered a one-two punch about home on, homebound status. I can't just let slide okay. because you mentioned about going to lunch and and some people, you know, look horrified um, <laughs> or fell out their chair because you you can't do that. It says you can go to the doctor, you can go to church, you can get your hair done. It does not say lunch. Okay, I actually. Back in the day, I talked to some of the folks at CMS. I had the opportunity and I was kind of punchy that day. And I said, you know, those examples, those are examples, right? Yes, those are examples. I said, you really should sell access to getting on the list. And they looked at me kind of awkward. And I said, because people are taking that list as though it's the only option. And I said, you could make a lot of money. Like you could make it say you can go to Walgreens, but you can't go to CVS. Yes. You can go here. I said, those companies would pay to get on that list. And they're like, no, these are examples. I said, I understand that. But sometimes we struggle with, it's like, that's the permission list. There is no place that's off limits for a person to go. They're not home hostages. The issue with Sherry said is how well did they do what was the impact of that? Did they stop to get lunch for a friend's birthday? Now they're in more pain. They had to take a four hour nap. They became short of breath. So they mustered up some effort for that special occasion and now are wiped out. Documenting they went to lunch and this is what happened supports homebound status. And a lot of seasoned home care clinicians would never write down they went to lunch. It's like, I don't put that down. I'm never writing that down. Oh, you mean like when they go to the doctor and you can't go give them therapy that same day because they just can't take it? They 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 put all they're just wiped. Yeah, that kind of stuff supports homebound better than a checkbox. And the other thing is, no, you don't have to talk about homebound status every single visit according to the regulation. Sometimes it's overkill. And that's why the boxes came into play. We're charged with confirming that at the beginning of care and periodically throughout as stewards of the benefit to routinely confirm that is this is still the most appropriate location for care. The reason it went to the overkill was it was, well, I'm not sure they're gonna remember. We're gonna forget. We got nailed on a survey because somebody went you know, three weeks and we didn't really talk about it. So let's fix it by making it mandatory for every discipline, every visit and make it convenient with boxes. And it's not just Sherry in my opinion, Denials are happening with that. Surveyors are taking exception to it. They're arguing that just giving me back these, these little bits of words is insufficient. So we just want folks to, to think a little bit more practically. How do you know they're homebound? I doubt it's because you got there today and they said, you know, it's been a taxing effort. I mean, <laughs> I took a shower this morning and I have not been able to get out of this chair for two hours. Boom, homebound right there. I don't even exactly. have to say you are homebound due to document what the patient just told me makes a very clear case why they cannot go off and do this as an outpatient. Absolutely. And and I have to share a funny with our listeners um, that happened actually in a patient visit that D Cornetti had where um, the police showed up at the visit and apparently the patient had violated parole on some level. I don't know what the, the circumstances were or what the crime was. And the patient was arguing with the police officer that he could not be arrested because he was homebound. <laughs> that doesn't work either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm homebound, you can't arrest me. No, it, the door does not swing that way for the patient, unfortunately, but it was, it was a funny that just has to be shared. So um, I'm gonna dive into the pool of maintenance now. I, I've saved this okay. because I wanted to make sure that we got them all together. We are we consider ourselves to be the maintenance therapy experts and and by virtue of the fact that we wrote the book. So and the fact that we've been talking about this since 2013 in begging folks to add this to the benefits for their um, for their clients and patients, because this is what helps to keep them out of the hospital. 
And all of us as, as clinicians have had those experiences where we've discharged a patient and we know we're going to see them in another week. We know they're coming back and it's like, okay, let's start the clock now. When is the fall going to happen? When is the exacerbation going to happen? They're coming back. I'll see you soon as they're leaving, as they're leaving your agency. Um, so my question, my first question, and this is a very basic question, Cindy, but I think that we cannot answer it enough. How is maintenance therapy paid for in PDGM? There still seems to be some myth, Sherry, that it's paid differently, um, a different rate, a different way. Um, it is absolutely not. We are in a model of episodic payment. And so we go in as a skilled therapy visit. It is tracked as a skilled therapy visit. It's a, you know looked at with respect to whether or not the episode ends up a lupa, but the payment for that is no different whether I'm on a restorative focus of care or a maintenance approach to care. So this idea, I think it comes from the fact, Sherry, that there is a different billing code for it to go on the claim. And that seems to create the, well, we must get paid different or it counts different. Why would we have a different code? But nursing has more than one code that can go on the claim to speak to some of the specific things they've been doing. Therapy has that code to differentiate between I'm on a restorative plan or I'm on a maintenance plan. So if it's not paid any different, and it's just about sticking codes on there, what difference does it make? Sherry, I got to share a recent example because we have an agency that has had to happen to them what I was always afraid could happen, which is they have embraced maintenance. They are doing maintenance well. They're really diligent about this with one exception. They didn't consistently follow through on the billing code. Mm. And so this care went in under the traditional therapy code, the one we use more often than not, which is tied directly to a restorative approach care. So what happened is they started getting denials about this and they looked at it and they're like, our documentation isn't the problem. We said it's maintenance. We know everybody's documentation could be a little bit better, but ours is pretty darn good. I don't understand this. And then they looked at the billing code because despite GMO, despite what the regulations say, when you use the wrong billing code, you're telling CMS with that code, I am doing restorative care. I expect improvement. And now you're sending in documentation where that is not what happened. So it sounds nitpicky, but man, they, they like to find nitpicky reasons to deny. So we got to make sure that the billing code is on there because then it says, I am doing maintenance and here's my notes and it is appropriately done maintenance. Now your denial loop has closed. Go find somebody else to go pester. But the idea that, well, it doesn't really matter then as long as I do all the clinical and documentation stuff right, man, they have, and again, you know, successful on appeal, yes, but appeals take time and dime and putting everything together and sending it in that could have all been avoided by actually putting the right billing code on the claim when you do maintenance. Here's a here's a really um, interesting technical question. When completing a research oasis on a client with the intent to move into a maintenance focused episode, should the research visit be coded as maintenance or restorative? And I, I my question is, Cindy, coded as I'm I'm trying to figure that out. Well, I think it's the billing code issue. So okay. I have been doing my therapy under the restorative code. It's time for research. I'm anticipating a transition to research in the new cert period to maintenance. What do I bill this visit as? Well, anytime we're dealing with a transition, so we started out with restorative and we're switching to maintenance, there is a regulation that comes into play. And what it says in there is that if you are going to move from restorative to maintenance, the expectation is that the building of the maintenance program is taken care of before the restorative part ends. So I am ending my res restorative use with this program in place, and I'm going to switch to maintenance to follow up on the program, to provide additional teaching and training, to do the periodic reassessments of the individual and the program to make any changes. Um, if it's under condition three, I'm going to 
execute the program because the program is so complicated that the patient and or the caregiver, I, I, only a therapist can do this. But so it would come into play to say, if my research is the last of these restorative, the program is in place, I am ready that the next visit will in fact be maintenance, that I would build a research as restorative and the first visit in the next one as maintenance. So it comes down to have I wrapped up restorative and the next visit is appropriately making that shift, I would still call the research visit restorative because it says that we have to wrap that up first before we start executing. Now, in case anyone kind of extrapolates down the wrong way, I can also do an evaluation and start this individual from maintenance as the jump. I don't have to do restorative first. It just seems to be the most common way the care plan goes is for these folks. We do expect and see an initial period of, of, of meaningful change, but the recognition that overall we're going to need to stay around to make sure this remains stable. But I could from the very beginning say this is going to be a maintenance course of care without any restorative. Right. And, and it's interesting, Cindy, because, you know, our one of our primary functions in home health is to keep folks in their home and out of the hospital. Um, and so when you're writing your when you're writing your maintenance um, plans of care and when you're writing your maintenance goals, start from there. Why am I doing maintenance? Is it to keep someone out of the hospital? Is it to keep them from declining? Then then write your goals and your and your notes accordingly. Um, it's, it sounds simple to us because we've been doing it for so long, but it's something that scares folks because we were, we were told in school, most of us of our age frame anyways, Cindy, that the word maintenance was taboo, um, which is why we've switched to the word stabilization sometimes to try and ease them in, ease folks into using this benefit for their, for their patients. Um, if, okay, here's another question about maintenance. If the patient is getting PT and OT, do both have to be maintenance at the same time? Actually, I participated in a podcast event yesterday that took that question even a little bit further about nursing and management and evaluation. Basically, mm -hmm. are these all conjoined activities? They're not. Um, PT and OT are independent disciplines from each other. And realistically, I could go in there as the PT and say, I think we have topped out at any legitimate shot of significantly improving their mobility. I'm concerned about decline, so I want to take a maintenance course here. Whereas OT may say, you know, on specific ADLs, I still think there's room for this to be better. Um, we would have to make sure that the documentation is clear on both sides, but they can proceed down a restorative course while the other's doing maintenance. Nursing in the picture does not mean, oh gosh, there's maintenance somewhere. They got to be M&E. Um, no, they need to make the decision based on what they're going to be providing to the patient, what their course of care is going to be. Now, you can imagine if, and Sherry, you know this has nothing to do with maintenance. We look at too many charts to say, I'm just looking at the PT notes, the nursing notes, and the OT notes. I'm not even sure it's the same patient because <laughs> they're way off. I mean, I'm, I'm reading where the nurse is talking about family members screaming, yelling, hiding the medications, all kinds of problems. Let's get a social worker. And PT went out and everybody's loving, kind, and singing kumbaya. And it's like, wait a second. What happened? We want to make sure we are on a reasonable page. So this is where, you know, case conference is also an opportunity to say, what is our focus? And how does this all fit together? Because it can all easily fit together, but it can also backslide into a, the documentation is so all over the place that it looks very confusing as to why that decision was made. So there's no rule that stops you from doing it, but you do need to make sure everyone involved is clear as to their decision making. And, and it, you know, maintenance is not only for um, the the folks with with extensive neurological diseases uh -huh. like Huntington's or Parkinson's or MS. But the example that comes to my mind, Cindy, in this is is the relapsing remitting MS patient. Um, some folks with MS are, are more um, more affected in their lower extremities or their upper extremities. Some their endurance. Um, oftentimes, folks with end-stage MS um, use a catheter um, for their urinary um, management. And so imagine that you have a patient that is having difficulty with walking. It affects their, their legs more than their, than their hands. And, they are, and, I'm, and I hate to break up that, that upper and lower extremity setting. I know you're probably cringing at me doing that. 
But but PT is going in there and they're showing you know a comeback from a from a relapse of their MS. And so they start with restorative. They go in with the restorative. There's not a lot of things going on with their hands, but but you know, so OT is not brought in. Nursing is brought in and they go, well, everything's good with the with the catheter. We're just gonna let therapy take care of it. Therapy gets to the point where the person is back to their previous level of function, but they want to make sure that they stay there. So they move them to a maintenance uh, uh, plan of care. During that maintenance plan of care, there comes an issue with their um, catheter. So what do they do? They call nursing back in and nursing is going to be doing restorative active care while therapy is doing their maintenance um, at the plan of care. Now we all think about that and we go, oh, that makes sense. Um, but that can happen in any disease process. I just use MS as an example because it's more commonly known in those situations. But that can happen in, in someone who has CHF, in someone who has um, brittle diabetes. I mean, there's a lot of different things where you could have each of the disciplines choosing their own path of care for their for their um, plan of care. So um, I, I hope that that kind of helps because I, I know that we're getting to some pretty deep questions in maintenance, Cindy. But I've got another one. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> And please use the Q&A box, guys, if you have any questions while we're on here. If a patient starts out as restorative and is moved to maintenance, do we have to discharge and readmit? Do we have to do a new OASIS, a follow-up, or a significant change in condition, what we used to call a skip? Okay, a couple of things. Um, no, you do not need <laughs> to discharge and readmit. That's, that is actually a very common confusion. Because when you think about making that kind of a change in the course of care, do we really need to stop and then restart? No, we do not need to do a discharge. The issue of a significant change in condition, we need to remind ourselves that that follow-up OASIS is completely at the discretion of the organization. So that becomes a decision in any patient. If we've seen something we believe is a significant change, particularly if that change could affect outcome measures and those kinds of things, then it needs to be an agency decision that says, yes, go ahead and do a significant change. Going to maintenance is not in and of itself considered an automatic significant change in condition. You better do another OASIS. It's looking at the individual patient situation and say, was this an expected course of care? Then there's no way I'd be doing a significant change. If this was really unexpected and multitude of things changed that led to this that we did not anticipate at the start of care, it could be warranted to do one. But that really is a agency option. And even if you say, well, I'm not going to do one, they don't penalize you or come after you or chase you down for that. But very often the issue comes down to was what happened to the patient anticipated? Did it fit with what we thought the course of care was going to be? And very often the idea of including maintenance is present when we start care. The timing of starting it may be a bit flexible. We are not sure how long they're going to need restorative first, but we see a potential for maintenance down the road so that when that time comes and we make the conversion, um, that would not meet the criteria of a significant change. We do want to make sure though that when we make that change, we are updating the care plan that we are communicating those changes to the physician so that they know what this course of care change has been, revisit the goals, um, make sure that they aren't still looking like improvement ones or just all of a sudden every single one of them says maintain. Um, we wanna make sure they fit with what we're gonna do. Um, so again, if you think about it, that decision making visit would actually count as a reassessment. I mean, it probably would be better written than some of the, oh gosh, it's 30 days. Um, but it speaks to what the intent, going back to the beginning, of a functional reassessment is. How do, what decision am I going to make as far as a course of care? And what did I make that decision based on? I didn't just go in there and go, ah, I feel like maintenance today. No, I looked at, at the day, uh, the objective information. I talked with a patient. I looked at the interventions. I utilized my skill based on all of these factors. I'm going to do this. Boom. So the reassessment got done at the same time. Okay, I'm going to go back, circle back to one other question, and we have another couple questions that um, have, have shown up. Um, is it possible for a maintenance therapy um, patient or a maintenance patient to receive home health aid services? Yes. Again, this is kind of, we got to stop thinking that maintenance puts them on an island. Um, maintenance is skilled care. So when they're in home health receiving skilled care, services such as the aid and the social worker are open to them should they need it. Um, so 
this idea, you know, I, I see it. I still think it's a, a residual thing, Sherry. Of it's some special thing, which means it can't really have others. Again, it's simply a focus of care. It is saying that therapy is going down one of two paths. Either I do believe there's a reasonable expectation for material improvement, or my goal here is to stabilize. I mean, that's almost the equivalent. Just to reframe it a bit, Sherry, yes. is would we say the patient's getting nursing? If the patient's going to get better with nursing, they can have an aid. But if the patient doesn't get better with nursing, they couldn't have an aid. That wouldn't make any sense. That wouldn't make any sense at all. The issue is you're getting nursing. Do you need an aid? Now, the focus of the aid could be different depending on the outcome, but we would never say, I don't think you can have an aid because you're getting nursing, but you're not going to get better. So it's the same thing here. It's a skilled service and it works the exact same way as a restorative would in the context of the benefit. So Cindy, I'm going to I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, we got a couple questions that came in um, just now, so it's awesome. Um, uh, tele telehealth monitoring. Um, some folks have heard some um, information about telehealth monitoring and wanted to see if if a um, couple of things. If is telehealth monitoring paid for in home health? I will let you take that question, Sherry, because I know particularly how you feel about that idea of whether or not it's paid for. <laughs> It is not. Um, we we use it frequently in home health, and we use it as part of the benefit very well. In in that we keep in contact, and we often have uh, folks that uh, act as patient liaisons that will conversate with folk with patients while they're on service. If they have any questions after hours, we do. Um, many of us have telehealth monitoring stations in homes that will do blood pressure and oxygen levels, and even many EKGs. We're seeing all kinds of technology that's entering the home. Unfortunately, currently, um, this moment, telehealth is not a paid for service in, in home health. It's encouraged because the positivity that comes out of it and the positive outcomes that come out of it are tremendous. However, it, it is not does not take the place of a visit. It is paid for in other post-acute settings, primarily outpatient. Um, and, and there's a new thing called remote tele telephonic monitoring or remote therapy monitoring. That is has recently been um, added to the Part B benefit for outpatient folks. So those of you that are doing the Part B services in the home, there may be an opportunity there to recoup some um, some funds um, based on the remote therapy monitoring. Um, it is not in home health yet. We hope that someday it may be, but currently it's not. Um, it that does not mean that you should not consider doing it, however, because there is a there is a definite um, upside to your outcomes and your patient satisfaction in doing those things. So as you go into value-based purchasing and you're looking at what technology um, solutions you have, just consider that that you know that, that you may have to outlay capital in order to get the equipment that you need, but that the return on that um, can be significant. Um, and especially keeping folks monitored and keeping them out of the hospital and keeping your outcomes at a high level and getting those you know elusive stars um, reported to CS to CMS so that you can um, be in that high category. Um, but yeah, definitely right now it is not paid for as a visit equivalent or as a visit, um, but um, it is in other settings. Did you have anything to add, Cindy? Well, I think the other thing to consider is that we're not really paid per visit either. Uh, we have been paid per visit in home health since 2000. So we got 22 years of not being paid per visit. We feel like we are because we still put visits on claims and therapists felt like they were for 20 years of that because the number of the visits was a calculating piece of payment, but it never is. It's strictly a tracking because they want to be fair. If I'm going to give you a lump sum of money for 30 days and you can get that lump sum by going one time, versus somebody who's going to go 10 times, I, I don't want people to be incentivized to go one visit and cash the check. If the person needs 10 visits, they should get 10 visits. So the LUPA issue is a stopgap to ensure that there's a minimum amount of interactions with the patient to justify the payment amount because some people would behave badly and unfortunately once they do that, they mess it up for everybody. But we still get very stuck in a visit mindset. So, no, we cannot use telehealth to replace a physical visit for purposes of tracking how many interactions in person we had with this individual. However, we're given a lump sum to manage them. So, using that technology to control for unnecessary visits 
or do we really need to go three times a week, maybe twice and, and following up with them with a phone call? Um, maybe that we can use the telehealth to more strategically have the nurse go when a problem has been identified using that technology and not just go Tuesday, Thursday because, oh, wait a minute, something happened. Now it's Thursday, Friday, but it's still twice a week. So we're still within compliance of our orders can help us utilize this more effectively and therefore would be paid in the context of an episodic payment. So I know we don't like that because, you know, you look around and go, hey, Sherry, how come part B can like put codes on stuff and get money and we can't do that. Part B is still paid by codes. Part B does not have episodic payment. So anything else, I mean, they live and die by whether or not what they do has a code. We don't have anything. So the idea being not, I, I, we're not foolish. I'm not saying everybody's going to run out and buy the latest, greatest technology and blow the bank on that. But we need to be thinking about it more of how could some of that technology make us better control our cost, keep people out of the hospital, get my desired outcome, and then is paid by what I've saved in us unnecessary visits, as opposed to I'm not touching that stuff till you give me a special code with a dollar value to it. Because I think we're missing some opportunities right now. And, and many of us, and I'll, I'll include myself, um, I've been in home health for 30 years. I mean, it is not something that's new to me. And oftentimes when I'm met with something that's new, that's available in home health, I look at it with an eye of, really? <laughs> is that really available in home health now? And it's got to be really expensive. I think that everybody needs to take a second look at some of the technologies that are out there for home health because they're not as expensive as you think they are. And the return on investment is, is in, tremendous when you can get plugged into systems as far as being able to get um, referral information in a timely manner to, in order to get uh, order signed in a timely manner. Just relook your techno technological um, uh, outlook on things because prices have come down. And I'll, and I'll use a personal example. Um, back in 1989, some folks on this call probably weren't born then. Um, I just it just dawned on me. Um, in 1989, I got I got my first single CD player in a car, and it literally was a single CD player installed, $999. I'll pause for effect. That's because it's it probably the size of a, a suitcase. <laughs> no, it was it was it was a normal size size of a regular radio, oh, really? right? Yeah, it was size of regular radio, but it was brand new technology. And and because it was brand new technology, it was super, super expensive. Um, some of the things that have been out for, you know, seven to 10 years now, some of the remote telephonic monitoring devices that do the, you know, the weights, the, the uh, hypertension or the um, blood pressures and the oxygen levels and all those kinds of things, they've been out for a while. So the prices have come down tremendously. And that's why I say, look at those things with a with a discerning eye and see how you can make your make your agency a little bit more innovative and a little bit more efficient. Because the most expensive thing that we do is hire, train, and then send a, a clinician out to a house. Because we have to pay mileage, we have to pay for the clinician's time, we have to pay a lot of different things. So so that you know, look at that technology and see how it can best you that yet yeah, best be utilized for your agency. Okay, Sydney, we're running um, towards the end of our session. We have about seven minutes to go. And I switched the slides so that you guys could see our contact information because many times you go on webinars and they ask you to input questions and you go, I don't have any questions right this second. I just ate lunch. I'm kind of getting a little sleepy, but one will come to you later. So the, use our email addresses and please reach out if you have any additional questions. And, and we're real good at getting back to you in a timely manner. And um, and and if you have any other additional um questions about what we do at K&K, &K, just visit our website at www.valuebeyondthevisit.com. Cindy, I have two more questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Is a leprechaun real? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> depends what time of day it is on St. Patrick's Day. How's that? There you go. There you go. No, I, that wasn't really the question because I happen to believe in leprechauns. So, so that, that uh -huh. probably just ran everybody else off the call. Okay, question. If a patient is receiving home health, can the patient go to outpatient therapy? In the technical sense, yes. And people get very, what? 
Are you sure? Well, it's it's the wonderful world of consolidated billing. And the bottom line is that because therapy, physical, occupational, and speech therapy are all part of the Medicare home health, Part A home health benefit, that if a patient were to go to outpatient therapy at the same time that they are a Part A home health patient, the Part B provider will not get paid. They will be redirected back to the home health agency to say, nope, therapy is part of your bundle payment thing. You have to pay the outpatient for the therapy. This was way more of an issue back in ye old days about whirlpools in particular, where the patient would have a wound, go to the doctor, doctor would send him for outpatient for a whirlpool. We didn't find out about it in home health until after like one or two visits had been done. Suddenly the outpatient provider is banging on our door looking for money because they can't get paid. We don't see that as much now. Um, where we do still see it is in relation to speech therapy and the modified barium swallow. You may say, wait a minute, we can't do that kind of test in the house. No, you can't. But the presence of a speech pathologist during the test can often then be kicked out of the bill because the argument is they are a home health part A patient and now a speech therapist did something. Nope, we're not paying for it. That comes out of the part A consolidated billing. So they can, that's probably the one. It's not a huge number. Um, it does happen periodically. But technically, you could say if I have a patient who really, really needs parallel bars and we just can't provide that here, um, we're going to make arrangements for them to go to outpatient. Arrangements would be more than just the transportation to and from and the appropriate physician referral to do it. It would also have to be what is the arrangement for payment because the home health agency is going to be responsible. So in any of those situations, you want to make sure as a Part A provider, you have an agreement in place with that entity that you are paying fair rates. You're not getting, you know, ridiculously high inflated rack rates. Um, you will want to be paying what they would have been paid by Medicare and not get price gouged. And since you're the payer, you have every right to ask for copies of notes and follow up and all of this. You would also have to be sensitive to the fact that if you're about to send somebody off for multiple outpatient treatments, somebody might question homebound. And so you would want to be very clear in the documentation as to how homeboundedness still is in play based on this individual's ability. That's mostly why, Sherry. The answer is yes. The application of it is typically no. Um, it's rare to see, and I think most people go, well, I really wouldn't do that with the outpatient, you know, parallel bar thing all that often. But what still slips through is that speech pathologist on the modified barium swallow. Um, and what's interesting is the rules are clear that if you as the Part A provider were not aware of that referral and have no financial relationship with that institution, you are not compelled to pay the bill they send you. But very often, you know, we like other referrals and we like good relationships with hospitals and we don't really want to get in an argument. So the isolated time it happens more often than not, we'll just go ahead and pay them to make them go away. But technically, those are the parameters around whether or not someone can go to outpatient and still be a home health patient. And, and I think we've seen it a little bit with wound care centers that employ therapists. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, the, the wound care centers that employ therapists, the physical therapist would be billed under Part B, and the wound care um, services would be billed under the Part A. So, so you oftentimes will see those kinds of bills coming from them, but you have to set up that contractual relationship ahead of time to have right. any application. Okay, last question. Woo okay, how specific should documentation be regarding manual therapy, and is it covered under Therex? I think this question came up a couple of times since our last Q&A. Um, I think we need to be very careful with Therex just being a very broad blanket term, especially when you start digging into what are you calling manual therapy? And very often as you talk to the clinician, they get very specific about techniques and interventions and why they did them that do not fit whatsoever under a blanket of traditionally assumed Therex of exercises with names and repetitions and resistance and that kind of thing. Manual therapy can be very different. So I would encourage us to not just use Therex as the blanket term for that. And if we're using Therex or manual therapy, those again are categories. You do want to be specific in either case as to what was done for this individual, why you chose those interventions, 
what the desired outcome is and what Sherry said earlier, tie it back to that F word. What is going to be functionally different or stabilized for this individual that's meaningful to them as a result of these interventions? And if your EMR doesn't give you a manual therapy, it just has Therex, yeah, that's a problem, but it doesn't change the fact that I'm going to need to determine then where in the EMR to put manual therapy and be able to to explain it. I can't just say, I just stuck it under Therox because that's all the EMR gave me. With that, we're going to tie up and apparently the dogs are ready to go. Um, and I am going to um, send out an informational sheet that uh, when the next time that we're going to have this session and hopefully um, it'll be the third Thursday in May. Um, and I have to look at those dates because Cindy has a son getting married and I got to make sure that we don't conflict with that. So look out for the email um, with the information for when our next session will be. And this recording will be going out to everyone as well. And also will be on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't had a chance to check out our YouTube channel, Cornetti and Craft, please go on there. And um, if you subscribe, it will notify you when we add new information, podcasts, um, guested podcasts with folks with uh, industry experts. And uh, many of our webinars are housed there for free. So, so take an opportunity to subscribe to that channel when you can. Cindy, thank you so much. And we'll see everyone in a couple oh, it's of It's always a pleasure. Take uh, care. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Bye.